Hello everyone. Um, is anyone there? Can you say hi in chat or something? I'm just making sure that everything is ready for what I want to show. And you can hear me properly and everything. testing the sound okay it seems to work fine so let's wait for a couple minutes um, to give everyone a chance to join to hear that everything is working well. So yes, um, I'll be recording in English, of course. Um, might have some international viewers and then this is for posterity, I guess. Uh, so please do ask questions and do interact because I want it so that it feels that I'm having a conversation with someone. I'm just uh, remembering Michael and my time with him and I rather than writing up something, I, I prefer to just um, verbally express and remember and tell anecdotes and things like that. Let me just go over my notes quickly. Let's see. on the side. Okay, so I think we are ready. are now ready to go so if anyone is in the chat do say hi um, this is gonna long uh, this is gonna last for long so it, I don't I don't mind uh, having a few people around at the beginning and others at the end um, I'll basically go over the timeline more or less of my interaction with with Michael and then uh, at any point uh, feel free to ask any questions and um, yeah, just um, freely uh, comment on chat, whatever whatever you wanted to to know about it. So Okay, so I think I will start. I will probably get some more people joining later on. But yes, so uh, my experience with Michael Atia. So I wanted to title this uh, A Mathematician's Night Dream because uh, Michael used to read a poem um, that uh, essentially expressed how mathematicians uh, during the day had to work with proofs and be rigorous and um, always go to the point and, and, and try to be very precise with their thinking and all their formulas. But at night, he said, uh, mathematicians uh, dream. And uh, he said that without dreams, there is no life, there's no art, there's no mathematics. And he always make it, made a, a big uh, emphasis on, on this side of mathematics where you're dreaming and where you're imagining and so on. 
And I got to experience that fir firsthand. In, in fact, one of the most, um, I guess, publicly known episodes of the, the last, uh, the last uh, few years of Michael's life was precisely uh, a, a dream that he had one night and he wanted to, to then tell the world and, and, and there was a bit of an upheaval uh, as a result. But anyway, I wanted to title um, the, this, this conversation or this um, account of my, of my memories of, of Michael Atiyah, uh, a mathematician's night dream for that reason, because he, um, he will always uh, point to this, to this poem and he always wanted to sort of bring it up and, and put it on slides and, and so on, because I think he, he quite liked that, that idea. So, um, what was my first encounter with Michael Atiyah? I, I joined the University of Edinburgh in the year 2015, where um, he was, and so he was in the Department of Mathematics, uh, and I joined the department as a PhD student with José Figueroa Fari, and we basically met in one of his talks. Uh, that was uh, my, my contact. There's nothing uh, particularly... Um, special about it he was just giving a talk and i attended and i thought it was very inspiring the talk was about the beauty uh, in mathematics and, and aesthetics more generally in science and so on um and i remember that well his talks on, on the beauty of mathematics were always uh, you know trying to go in all possible directions and and perhaps highlighting some of, of his current thought on a particular topic in mathematical physics or in, in you know applying geometry to fundamental physics and so on and in this particular talk he uh, at the end gave a, a, an appeal to, to to the young in the audience he said uh, all, all these questions are out there for young mathematicians to explore and he said except the young and myself because he, he always um, sort of included himself in the young in, in a very uh, funny way because he, he always sort of putting himself in the in the sentence um, so I, I felt that after hearing this this very inspiring talk about the beauty of mathematics from from this uh, Titan uh, of, of well international mathematics really uh, certainly uh, British mathematics but definitely also international mathematics and and he he appeared so passionate and so current in some sense um, that when he actually called for young people, young mathematicians to uh, work on those kinds of ideas, I actually thought this could be me. I am in my, I think I was at that time, my second year of the PhD. And I, okay, I had some, some problems I was uh, trying to solve and some, some project that I was working on, but I felt that I had plenty of time to certainly mm, give it a thought. And because it was an explicit call, I felt compelled to just go up to, to his office and knock on his door and, and ask for, for, for a meeting with him. And uh, this is what I did. It turns out that his office was just besides mine. So essentially, I, we had a shared PhD office and down the corridor was my supervisor's office, another office, and then Michael's uh, office. So he shared the office with Andrew Roniski, who is a very famous uh, topologist who also retired here in, in Edinburgh. And sadly, he also died a few years ago, uh, a couple of years before Michael. And they shared office. And, in, and it was a lovely office uh, to always go back to. And in fact, that picture is taken in that office. And, and he was always very, um, very happy to, to uh, welcome people in the office. And, and it, was, it was really uh, quite, quite an experience to go to the office and, and see uh, Andrew and, and Michael. And they will be chatting and, and, and you know. Uh, printing things back and forth and Andrew got a hold of the printer much better than, than, than Michael so he, he was kind of always uh, getting called by Michael to, to print um, the papers and, and things to read and so on um, but but that's that's how I met Michael so I went into the into the office one day I just knocked on the door and, and said Michael uh, I was in your talk a few a few days ago um, and I am a young mathematician I just my office is few meters away down the corridor and I'm interested in all the ideas that you are that you are presented I, I think he was very pleased pleasantly surprised I mean he 
later on I realized that this is his reaction with anyone who, who shows any, any minimum interest in, in, the, in the things he's saying. But, but I felt extremely welcome. I mean, he didn't know me at all. He didn't know I was working with Jose. He did know Jose, uh, who, who was uh, in the Edinburgh Mathematical Physics Group. And uh, Michael Adia was, of course, an honorary member of the, uh, of the Edinburgh Mathematical Physics Group. Um, and, but he didn't know this, so, so I, I was just a random PhD student to him. And, and he very enthusiastically asked uh, about, oh, what is your background? Uh, you, you're doing this kind of mathematics? Uh, and I said, well, I come from physics. And so he immediately associated me with physics. He, he said, okay, Carlos is going to be the physicist in our conversations, which that never really changed until, until sadly his death. Um, I, I was the physicist to him, and he would uh, talk to me as someone who, who can understand the mathematics and the geometry, but who is interested ultimately in physics, which is partly true. I am a, a physicist by training, and I am interested in, in the foundations of physics at the end of the day, and the foundations of science in general. So it was, it was an interesting, it was an interesting um, uh, part of the part of the conversation with Michael to to try to explain that yes I was a physicist but I, I was interested in all these other areas and that's something that he of course understood very well because Michael uh, is well known for being uh, such a you know far-reaching mathematician anyway and having and having influenced uh, theoretical physics in so many ways so so that's how it all began I um, I didn't have any particular um, intentions. I didn't have any particular plans. I just wanted to meet the person. I wanted to meet this personality that uh, that was uh, bursting with energy uh, in, in a couple of talks. I had seen actually two talks, the uh, one on the beauty of mathematics. The other was on the uh, geometric model of the electron uh, that he, he was he was working on uh, with some some collaborators from Cambridge and from Edinburgh. And 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 the, the, so the call for for young mathematicians was in the second one in the in the sort of geometric model of of, of, of particle physics. Um, the first one was just about beauty, and it was in a very big lecture hall um, in the University of Edinburgh, and that was quite a lecture. It was probably three hundred people in the audience, and it was just him going on about how uh, you know, having a favorite theorem is quite like saying what is your favorite piece of music that some days you listen to something and you're enamored with it for a few weeks and then you change and so on. So it was, it was to me, it was very clear personally as someone who is very moved aesthetically and I'm normally very driven aesthetically by art and by, uh, by music and so on. It, to me, my, my, my first interface with Michael was this sort of aesthetics and, and artistic side of mathematics more than, you know, the long, long history of, of uh, results and, and theories that have been developed from by Michael himself and from his work, right? Which in some sense is a, a sprawling tree of mathematical theories, right? Um, but to me, Michael sounded like someone that that in some sense felt very close to me because I, that's exactly how I experienced mathematics and science in this very aesthetic and sort of almost artistic way. And, and I connected very quickly with that. So when in the second talk that was more technical, it was more about the, the science of, of models of, of matter. When he gave this call uh, to young mathematicians, I felt that I needed to interact with him somehow because I, I, I was there in the, in the department. I didn't really, other than my supervisor at the time, I didn't really connect with anyone scientifically in the department. Um, you know, everyone was doing their thing and, uh, you know, it was just a matter of furthering your, your PhD or your research. And I didn't really find a, a sort of a scientific home in, in, in Edinburgh. So when outside, as I say, the conversations with my supervisor. So it was very, um, at least it, the first time I see, I saw it, it was very uh, attractive to, to see this apparently very famous mathematician. But anyway, he was a few meters away in the corridor. Uh, so it felt very approachable, and so I just showed up, and, and he was he was very very enthusiastic. Which now I know it's just part of his personality, but to me, I, I felt immediately welcome in, in his in his office. So, so yes, so his office. Uh, I wanted to make a little bit uh, of, a, of a summary of what it was like. So his office was a very small office in the in the, in the top uh, corridor of the of the School of Mathematics in the University of Edinburgh. 
And uh, the office, whenever he was in, because he used to uh, to come in at, at age 86, I think it was, when, when I first met him, uh, he used to come in, I think, every other day of the week. And he would come in early and have a full working day. And uh, he would meet visitors from all over the country and all over the, the globe. And whenever there was someone there, you could hear him from several uh, several corridors away. So, so the, the door was always open and he was always moving his hands and with, with his walking stick, as you can see in the picture, he would, he would sit down with a walking stick like this and, and you know, waving his hand and talking. And then uh, at one point we'll say, oh, I need to move to the, to the Blackbird. And this will be a, a big effort to stand up and, and walk. But he would walk to the, to the Blackbird and really use the Blackbird. And it felt like he was an old man. He was uh, physically uh, impaired to, to some degree, but the energy was there. You, you could see that the, all the mathematical uh, energy and all the enthusiasm for science and for mathematics was there. Um, so my meetings with him uh, were always like that. Um, he constantly um, moved around and, and he, he was always sort of like looking up to the ceiling and, and, and making big claims and so on. It was, it was a very energetic uh, person and, and he was very old. So, so to me, that was very, um, very charming and, and very shocking when, when I first uh, met Michael. Um, and so then I think I can't remember exactly what uh, the conversation was like when we, when I, when we first met. But I think that because I, because I suggested that I wanted to work on those problems, that, that the reason why I was knocking on his door was that he, has, he had given this talk and he, has ended, he had ended saying, you know, any young mathematicians should take these problems up and should start thinking about these questions. I said, well, I am a relatively young mathematician. I, I think I can, I can try to do this. So he was immediately um, quite happy to to see very uh, physically, very, very materially, his call being answered. And so I think he immediately thought, okay, Carlos is going to be like a, like an assistant or like a student or like, a, like some, some kind of uh, research uh, assistant to, to, to him. That, 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 I think, was his mindset from, from the get-go because he had a few uh, students uh, from Cambridge and Oxford and other places in the world uh, that were uh, working with him or, or having conversations with him and, and, and they were somehow collaborating and, and they were uh, in, in conversation. M Michael, as I would say later, was very much a conversationalist uh, and, and he, he really liked the conversational side of mathematics and I think he uh, basically was thriving in this, this style of, of mathematics. So that was the premise. The premise was that I was going to continue with my PhD, of course, with Jose Figueroa at the University of Edinburgh, but at the same time, I would meet Michael maybe once a week and uh, he'll give me things to think about. And uh, he, he, he had told me, oh, we're writing this couple of papers with these other people and you work on this other paper and I have a couple of ideas of what we can do. So I, I the first time I met him when he was 86 and it was only three years before he died, um, he was like in the middle of a very busy research career, right? And, and so this is well after he retired from mathematical work and well after he is basically uh, retired in Edinburgh and, and living a peaceful life. So I felt I was just joining uh, a big uh, endeavor of, of research uh, with, with other students and other people. That, and he kept, kept telling me, oh, this, this other person is coming from Poland and then we're going to have a meeting here and there and, and so on. So that was the that, that was the first encounter. That's how I got to know him in the first place. Now, now the, the first um, proper contact that we had more personally uh, is was a beautiful day uh, that I want to recall now because it it probably was the first time that I felt that Edinburgh was the place where I was and I was living the city in some in some um, more um, I don't know more tangible sense because. Pao Enrique, uh, Pao, very good friend of mine and, and member of SEM, for those who know, uh, he came to Edinburgh to do a PhD in um, categorical quantum mechanics, same University of Edinburgh, but in the informatics department. And it was only a few months after he came that I told him, look, I am in contact with Michael Atiyah, and uh, Michael Atiyah was always very eager to go out and have a dinner and introduce people that didn't know each other and... and have some contacts uh, among uh, uh, different people. I mean, 
Michael Adia was really uh, a, a network machine. He was ne he was a network network engine for for mathematicians. So he decided that we should go to have Spanish tapas, and because I was Spanish, I should make the booking. And he was always saying, uh, "Your Spanish name is going to open doors," and uh, which he just meant you need to call and, and make a, a, a booking. So uh, so there's no way they would know my name. It was just you know his his way of thinking that I was Spanish. I should I should arrange for this tapas meal, and so we we went on and uh, we had a we had a meal with my supervisor Jose, with I think was uh, John from the from the mathematical physics group uh, as well in Edinburgh, and then Pau and myself uh, with with Michael, and and this was the first time that I got to see Michael uh, the the person and not Michael the mathematician, and and he he was always so interested in everything. He, he wanted to, to understand what people were doing, why things were the way they were, and you know where everyone came from. Uh, he always tried to uh, search for connections when Pau was saying, oh, I come from this village in Castellón, this smaller town. And like he, he's always trying to make connections. He's uh, had all this information uh, of you know the world and, and world politics and world cultures and so on. And, and he always wanted to make connections, arguably, this is the same mindset that he had in mathematics, where he was always trying to find connections among very different or seemingly different uh, areas of mathematics. So it was very interesting to see that uh, same mentality, but in a purely social and, and casual context. It was very, very interesting. So we had some tapas there. Uh, that was the time when I uh, got to know that Michael was very eager uh, to have any kind of almond-based dessert, and uh, that almonds or almond sweets would remember would remind him of uh, Lebanon and Egypt, because uh, his father is Lebanese. Atiya is a Lebanese name, and he, and he uh, spent uh, some some time in, in his youth in Egypt, and he would remember um, the time when he was there, and any almond-based dessert uh, will um, sort of bring that back and he was always very vocal about it and he was always saying oh uh, these almonds yes this tastes like the sweets I, I used to go to the to the market in the street and he, he really liked that and so that's where basically our story begins um, then uh, a few months later um, Michael as I said was in the middle of, of what seemed like a big uh, production of, of research and a, and a big project and he got a Leverhulme grant, and uh, this is a, a research grant that you, that you can get to to pay for postdocs and pay for for travel and so on. And I mean, at 86 years of age or 87 years of age, he got this grant, um, and so he could actually hire some people. Um, so Michael made me the proposal that, uh, especially because my PhD funding was going to run out in three and a half years and the programs usually last for four, in my case it was five because I had to, uh, I had to postpone. Um, so he, he mentioned that uh, all these meetings that we were having, if we wanted to make them a bit more official, I could be officially his research assistant and I could have a bit of salary coming from uh, this, uh, this grant that, that he just got. So I was extremely excited, of course, because that paid for the PhD for the last few months of my PhD. So I actually owe it to, to Michael that, that I could finish my PhD because I don't know what I, what I would have done because I, I needed a year and a half of funding that was not coming from the scholarship because the university only could only fund three and a half years. And I needed four and a half at least uh, for my project. So I, I really owe it to him. I mean, part of my of my wish to, to do this uh, video is um, to really immortalize my, my gratitude to Michael for many things, but especially for uh, the research assistant position because that really gave me the extra uh, funding to, to finish um, the, the PhD. And here I am now with, with, with PhD and the, and the research that is being published and so on, um, all thanks to Michael indirectly as well. So, so he offered offer me this research assistant position and uh, I definitely agree as I say and the it wasn't it wasn't clear what I, I would be doing exactly with him but he basically just wanted to make the point that I was going to be his assistant and we should have more regular meetings and so on so basically um, what we decided to do was three things so we decided that we we're going to sit down and talk 
and do uh, what um, we would compare to the collected works of Michael Atilla, these volumes that are very well known, we were going to do some kind of collected thoughts. And so we would sit down and he would speak and I would maybe record or write down and, and basically uh, have, have a, um, a trace record of that. Now, this was my idea and he liked it. He wanted to do it, but he got so caught up with the research that he that he was thinking about and the, and the scientific questions that he was thinking about that we could actually never do this so we we, we never got the chance to to really sit down and have conversations we had a, a long list of uh, topics that we wanted to cover I and mean, it essentially covered everything because we wanted to somehow uh, collect the the different um aspects of, of philosophy or, or, or thought that he that he thought were, were important, which covered anything from politics to family life, to mathematics, to science, beauty, art. It was it was about everything. And we had a, a big plan. We had several pages of, of notes on, on, on how to go about the conversations and I would record the conversations and then I will transcribe them and we'll probably make some kind of written text out of that. Um, the, the story goes that we couldn't do any of this. Um, it was impossible. He was so energetic about the research questions that he was thinking about at the time that we just never got around to, it, to do that. Um, I, I worked as a research assistant and, until his, his passing in, in, in 2018, but I never got the chance to, to, to actually do this, this part of the project. Um, and uh, yes, it, it was it was it was a bit it was a bit sad that we didn't get to do this because it would have been nice to have a sort of a photograph or, or still of, of Michael's mind at that time because his mind was very full of ideas and it was very active. Um, but he he got very very excited with with the mathematical ideas. I'll talk about those in in a second. But um, but he he somehow was really living his best life in some sense uh, in his in his own uh, personal perspective i think and and he i guess never saw it a priority to sit down and collect his thoughts and you know spend some non-trivial amount of time just uh, re rethinking and, and saying and and he always said oh there, there are interviews that i've done in the past um and you can look at those and and he he never uh, got the patient I think because he was so excited. It was, it was very honest excitement for, for the ideas and, and for the research and so on. So, um, so then my, my, my job was going to be essentially help Michael with whatever he needs when it comes to his research, his scientific activity. And so his scientific activity consisted on waking up at around six in the morning, having some tea, then going into the into university or staying at home but essentially um writing things down in in paper and then having meetings with a, his secretary or with myself and then we will type them up and maybe uh put them into latex and compile them into into a nice document or or simply just have the conversation and, and then maybe write something else um so my work, uh, just to just to be completely clear, my work consisted in go go talk to Michael, um, have maybe an hour long uh, scientific conversation. Or really, it could be about anything, as I'll say later. But um, and then after that, uh, I'll I'll collect some notes and maybe he said I need this the slides for this talk I'm giving or I need this uh, typed up in LaTeX and so I would I would help with with um, with the LaTeX well and and, and and the marking up and the and, and generally, technology, whenever it came to, uh, for example, there were some computations that we had to do, some polynomial computations and those things I could help with. And, and yeah, so, so, that, so that was my role. So officially, it was a, it was a research assistant role. But by the end of, of, of Michael's life and by, by the time that um, we, we had gone into a routine and we, are, we were doing this regularly, um, my, my position was very much like um like a collaborator in some sense or like a like a co-researcher i was i was going uh to his office just to discuss the several uh the several items that um that, that we were discussing so let me show you some um examples of these notes so these are these are notes that he typed 
uh, uh, prior to our meetings. So you can get a sense of, of the kind of work that we were doing together from this. Um, so this is, so this, I, I imagine this is uh, 23rd of November uh, of 2017, probably. And this is, Michael was thinking of writing a course and a book on, on some of the um, geometric models of matter. This, this, is, this is a project that he had been doing with uh, Nick Manton from, from Cambridge and I uh, think Bernd Shores as well in Edinburgh, and maybe someone else that I might be forgetting. But this, this was some um, research project that, that he, has, he had been doing and there had, there had been a few papers published in years prior. And, and, but he was generalizing this and he was telling me about it and he was extremely excited. Uh, to, to talk about chemistry and to be able to use geometry to describe chemistry and so on. Um, and so you can see some, some examples here. Now, uh, he, we would talk about, you know, connections between geometry, chemistry and, and nuclear physics, then uh, move to, to other topics that he always said were, were uh, the fantastical land. He always said uh, quintics and black holes and uh, octonions were in the in fantasy land. And then he would uh, usually uh, mention some some of his uh, favorite topics, you know, uh, Jones polynomials and and K theory applied to to knot theory and so on, and then uh, something that already appears here, which is going to be uh, a big part of the of Michael's uh, scientific uh, interests at, at the end of his life, are physical constants. So I remember when the first time he described to me a magic square of dimensions and, and how he was thinking that physical constants should be something like transcendental numbers in mathematics. And, and so this, this idea was uh, very present in the beginning of, of my, my interactions with Michael. But as the months went on, uh, it became the major motivation of the major uh, research um, direction that, that he, he wanted to pursue. And that's actually the, the the one idea that we discussed the most was um, how some physical constant constants might be interpreted as mathematical transcendental numbers like like pi or e or something like that um, so yes yeah, so then uh, he would also uh, remind me of, of some lectures that he, he'd have to give and then uh, I'll have to help with the uh, with the slides or something like that so let's see some of my notes to see if I remember something uh, so this will be a note I'll be taking. Um, yeah, so, so so talking about the course, oh, so this is 2016, uh, rather, not, not 2017, 2016, it's even earlier. Uh, <clears throat> and yes, yeah, so th they, they were, he was thinking about uh, working on a book to be finished by the end of uh, 2017. Now this is uh, later on in December, 2016. So this is uh, logistics about lectures, uh, and then going back to the hydrogen and helium uh, models. Right. So this is where where he he would mention things like uh, energy and entropy, um, and 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 would make all these analogies between geometry and energy and entropy and information and so on. And so so Michael uh, had never really worked uh, on on anything. Uh, too closely related to to ent entropy or, or you know all these uh, modern approaches to to entropy and information theory and so on, but he had a very good intuition about those those topics and in fact that that was my first contact with with those um, with those lines of thought and and it was interesting that Michael never really worked on any, on any of those things but he I think he absorbed the 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 understanding about them and, and he he would mention them quite regularly and then of course there's the Jones polynomial so so this was the one project that I did with Michael I uh, I learned some basic K theory and, and some basic knot theory and and he he said that he wanted to re-express some some of the results that he had found in the in the sort of K theoretic approach to the Jones polynomial and he wanted to Sort of rewrite it and, and send it off, and uh, that was my publication with with Michael Atiyah. Uh, I think the title is um, K theory and the Jones polynomial. So it's a very short paper where Michael wanted to reformulate um, what the Jones polynomial meant uh, from in the angle from the angle of, of K theory. So 
I worked there as a as a co-author. He was very generous to to uh, um, to let me be co-author because really all I was doing I was was um, following up on on his thoughts. I wasn't really um, contributing any original ideas per se. Um, but it was it was very interesting because uh, I thought that if I was ever going to learn any K theory, it would be very appropriate to learn it from Michael himself, and and so that was a that was a very beautiful experience. So let me see what other notes do I have around here. So for example, so this might be later the same year. So again, uh, the course in the book and oh yes, so the, he was thinking about uh, giving all these all these lectures right. So this is a this is a this is a course plan. Um, and yes, trying to trying to fit all these topics into into uh, into a lecture course. This never happened, sadly. Um, but uh, but yes, he was he was trying to 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 go that route. Now we have the first mention of Riemann here. This will be an, another important um, line of work that that he would embark himself on later on. But let's see what else we have. Right, so this was, I remember this meeting. So this meeting, uh, these notes are from a meeting where, um, again, on the topic of geometry and energy and entropy and information and so on, uh, he would be always uh, mentioning how he thought that uh, the macro scale and the micro scale uh, were two very distant ends of, of the middle interesting ground. And he, he used to call this Middle Earth, and he, he used to say that he was he was an, in, an inhabitant of Middle Earth. He lived between the micro scale and the micro scale, and and this was a way. There was a subtle way to kind of disengage with quantum mechanics and to disengage with cosmology and sort of more uh, theoretical cosmology and and more black black hole theory and and this kind of stuff. So he really wanted to confine himself to um, more directly observable physics. And, and he had this favorite anecdote of his that he would tell over and over again. And he, as it was mentioned in the, in, in the conference that just happened in Cambridge, uh, he very much enjoyed um, uh, recalling Einstein saying that when, when he, reportedly, when uh, all the new particles were being discovered in the 40s and 50s uh, in nuclear physics, uh, when asked about his opinion, he said, well, I very much would like to understand the electron, and and so he very much liked this this anecdote, and it represents very well what Michael was thinking at the time. He wanted to really mathematically tackle the core of observable physics. He didn't want to really discuss subtleties of quantum mechanics that much, and he didn't want to go into the direction of cosmology or other uh, more theoretical aspects of, um, of physics. So, so obviously, M Michael, as a mathematician, was extremely abstract. He would always be thinking about topology and number theory and algebra and all these uh, more abstract, elevated ways. But when it came to science, he always had a very direct and, uh, and more uh, sort of tangible, I think, way of thinking. And so the way that he used to describe this uh, is by by the term Middle Earth. And he, he used to say that you know, I am uh, my, my size is not too too high, not too short. I I, I, I live in Middle Earth, and he he would he would describe that uh, so that, that in between of the macro scale and the micro scale. Um, so anyway, so let's see what else do we have here. So there's another another meeting. This is already in January after Christmas in 2017. Uh, yes. So for example, uh, another. A little bit of history. This was when Penrose was invited um, to Edinburgh, and sadly I missed that meeting. I couldn't. I couldn't be there to meet Penrose, uh, but he was very excited, and, and they, they were meant to be giving him an, an honorary professorship, I believe, and uh, apparently, um, so they, they were going to record uh, a conversation with Penrose, which was essentially an interview. They wanted to interview uh, Roger. And um, and they had prepared a set of, of questions. In fact, I, I remember working on some of those questions because Michael was going to be the host of the interview. So the interviewer in some sense. And um, I, I was already a bit skeptical about this because I thought Michael probably is not the best interviewer because he talks a lot. He, he's a very dominant conversationalist. Um, and so it turns out that that conversation, which is recorded, I think it's, kind of, it's accessible somewhere in the University of Edinburgh, um, 
has Michael talk for over 80% of its duration. So it's, it's very interesting. It's meant to be an interview of, uh, of, of Roger Penrose, and it ends up being essentially uh, uh, a Michael Atiyah monologue. But anyway, it's, it was a conversation between the two. It was, it was very interesting to have. And, um, and he, there was a, all, 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 all a build up to, towards this. And actually uh, Penrose's brother, I think is uh, is based in Edinburgh, and so they had a meal with with his brother as well, and yes, th that was very interesting. And and this is the first uh, instance where you can see that on the twenty second of June twenty seventeen, uh, Atia uh, went to Madrid, right? So so this is the one thing that I was responsible for, and I have to thank uh, my friend Carlos Blanco that uh, he arranged uh, for a visit to the to the. Um, to the Royal Palace in Madrid, and we we had a lovely time. And I have a few pictures of this, so I'll sh I'll show you after after um, I cover these notes, um, because that's that was sort of the more um, direct interaction that he had with me it was more my personal time with Michael, and so I leave that to the end. Um, so what else do we have here? Um, so this is later on already in February. Let's see. So yes, so this is very much around the models, the geometric models of matter. So as you can see here, exclamation mark nuclear dynamics happen in the moduli space of, of metrics on manifolds. So this is very much the flavor of uh, geometric models of matter, um, where <clears throat> Riemannian manifolds uh, would describe a single particle, right? So what else do we have here? Right, so there was this time when um, he was he was in conversation with uh, high pressure physics people and i remember uh, i i went into his office before one of our meetings and and he was still talking to the, the previous person that would they went into into his office and uh, this this was a high pressure physicist and and it, somehow completely unrelated to everything else that we, we were doing but apparently there was one paper that mentioned something that could have some relation to his geometric models of matter and, and he made a point in, in this situation, there was a number of theories, there was the high pressure physicist and it was myself. And we, we were all in the same room because we were sort of shifting uh, meetings with him. And it was quite incredible to see him in the middle of this and sort of convening perfectly uh, how high pressure physics was related to number theory and how I was interested in foundations of physics and how all that all connected. It was just Michael at his prime in, the, in some sense as a, as a social networker. Um, so what else do we have here? This gravitational fluctuation is top knot, so some more geometry, right? And so this was the other project that this is later on. This is May two thousand seventeen. So the other project that uh, that he uh, really started working on. He so I should mention that he really had this this view that he was climbing a massive ladder. That the the project was just beginning. And, and so I remember now that when I joined um, as, a, as, a, as a research assistant of his, somehow the, the atmosphere was, this is just the beginning. We, we are still mapping out the, the roadmap of where to go. And this is when he was 87 years old, right? Um, so it's, it's quite remarkable that at this age, he was having this initiative to, to, to have a long program. And that's why he, he always made the point of we need young mathematicians working on this. Um, so he, he really believed that he needed to prove, he needed to give very uh, concrete proofs of known results in this uh, new view of his. His view at this point, 2017, was mostly about um, the, the idea that the, fun, the, the fundamental constants in physics should correspond to some transcendental numbers in, in you know, or, or transcendental constants in mathematics. So he's going to try and prove some theorems to for, for people to pay attention to it, right? So he's, he decides to go for a for a classic group theory theorem, the five Thompson theorem, uh, which says uh, that a group is soluble when it has uh, a sequence of subgroup subgroups satisfying that, meaning that it's, that it's simple. Um, so, so he would work on this, and uh, I'll, I'll help him with uh, typing up and in conversations. I'm obviously not an expert on, on group theory, 
by any stretch, but uh, I could, we could have conversations about it and I would try to understand roughly what he was he was doing and so on. Now, of course, this is from later and then it's just a question of what is a fermion. This is what he says. And so so these are these are some of my my own notes for what to do after after meetings. So um, and oh, this is a very sad historical note. Um, so I'm just reading. Let me see. This should take. Yes, this is this is a, this is a bit of a sad uh, note that I that I wrote down here, because yes, I wrote that the collected thoughts uh, book or a, or a summary that we were going to do would be ready for the ninetieth birthday, um, in, and which was coming up uh, only a few months after he died, and. Um, that that would never see the light of day, essentially, because he passed away. But yeah, it's a bit a bit of a sad note. And then, yes, um, you can see here there's a little note on Turon. So Turon is a traditional suite from from where I'm from, uh, from Alicante in Spain, which is a which is an Arab influenced um, dessert, typically consumed in Christmas. Um, and when when he mentioned that he really liked almonds and so on, I thought immediately of this. So I brought him some some to run and and then every christmas uh, after that he always remembered that and so i brought some some more to run and so it's part of the, the more personal connection that i had with him that, that he always identified uh, uh identified myself with um, with that part with spain with the mediterranean almonds and so on and i remember uh, i i went on um, on saint james's way camino de santiago in spain and um, and of, of course the most typical um, sweet to have there is the Tarta de Santiago is this cake that's essentially made of almond and so I brought one of those back and he was uh, very very excited and, and he, he, he was always telling me how he was saving and, and not, not really having too much because he wanted it to last and so on so it's, it was very really heartwarming to see the mathematician all busy at, at, at this point I think he was already 88 years old and, and then just Going on for maybe five ten minutes on, on on how good the almonds are and, and you know and, and trying to uh, find the connections of the, the trade routes in the Mediterranean and all the all the history of it. So anyway, um, so that was the that was the the end of, of uh, that project um, and and so what came after so the end of the project uh, of the fight on some theorem and what came after was um, well his visit to Madrid that was. That was the, so let me just turn this off. Let me see if we can find, yes. So this is, this is a picture from um, Michael's visit to, to Madrid. So you can see here um, on, the, on the left, you have Carlos Blanco. Then next to him is Ismael, uh, who was another, um, who was at the time in Cambridge, I believe, in Trinity College, and was in conversation with Michael. And then there's Michael and there's myself. And that's just uh, outside uh, the Royal Palace in Madrid. And so I think I have a video that I just, that just shows a few seconds of us uh, walking around. Uh, hopefully you can see uh, that at this age, this is 88 years old, you're still walking around Madrid in the sun and very energetically talking. So I'll, I'll just play it for a few seconds. There was always wars. And anyway, there was actually a little war in England. That was very good too. Mm -hmm. And the depth of the war turned everything upside down. Mm -hmm. So the scientists were able to, people were not being. So I'm sure that you could see there Michael <laughs> being Michael uh, talking about history with, with Carlos Blanco, uh, just uh, finding connections. And he walked all the way from where the taxi. Uh, and dropped and dropped us off uh, a few meters behind to the palace, and then inside the palace they they used a wheelchair to to walk, go around because there's way too much walking. But 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 this is this was him. I mean, he was as alive as you can be. I mean, this this is perhaps the the one the one thing I really wanted to mention and to show these pictures and to show this these memories is that Michael was very much alive. Um, he, I mean. I, I cannot I cannot say that I, that that 
I could perceive a different energy in him than in myself. Okay, fair enough. At times he might get sleepy or, or you know, with the breathing, especially towards the end of his life. The first, the, the last few months were a bit, a bit more complicated, but, but the energy was incredible. And, and this is something that uh, I learned later on because I went to conferences where people knew Michael or I went to, or I've been in Cambridge this last week in his uh, memorial conference. And, um, and this is what everyone reports, that when they met him as a, at a younger age, uh, that he was a very fast talker and a very fast thinker. In fact, I was at Trinity College having dinner a couple of days ago and uh, there was a master there that, that knew Michael quite well. And someone commented, um, uh, Michael used to talk very fast. And then the master replied, and think very fast. So, so he, he, he had this energy and this burst of, of, of mathematical thinking and, and, and uh, analytical thinking and conversation. He was always talking. He was always in the middle of conversations and, and the middle of, 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 of the whole uh, um, sort of... Um, bus right um so let me see i think i have another picture here from that trip which yes which was the eating um so i very much enjoyed eating with michael as i as i mentioned already with the with the sweets and the almonds and so on so i i i think michael really enjoyed um all the mediterranean references and the fact that i mean i i love mediterranean cuisine i, I am from alicante from the coast in, in southern eastern Spain, and um, and so just talking about food and 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 the the cultural uh, heritage of, of of cuisines in in different parts of the world, he very much enjoyed that. He he had his favorite restaurants in Edinburgh, and he would always go back to them and and talk to the people and talk to the staff there. And yes, it was it was it was it was a joy to to have food with Michael. And I I love this picture that I that he he allowed me to take in Madrid. Um, we're just sitting down, having some aubergines, some cheese, some bread, and and it, it, this is the kind of thing that you, you, th I think you love to see, you know, like when 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 someone likes something so much. And I think this is go this goes back to my personal connection, the kind of personal connection I felt with Michael when I, in in the middle of of my PhD, when I felt a little bit alone and a little bit um, isolated, perhaps, and a little bit sort of not inspired by by the by the projects and so on because everyone had a very i don't know um how to say sort of workers mentality about mathematics it's like oh i have to do my thesis and i have to publish this paper and so on and then there was this old man seemingly old but very energetic man uh talking about the beauty in mathematics and how one day your favorite theorem is in group theory and the next day is in geometry in the same way that one day you like a Beethoven symphony and the next day you like a Bach partita. And, you know, this, this to me really connected, uh, as, I, as I mentioned earlier on. And then uh, it, was, it was very nice to bond over things like, like food and, and to be able to um, connect and, and see uh, um, um, a reference for me, right? I mean, this, this person has, has been arguably one of the most influential mathematicians of the 20th century. And to be able to sit down and to see that, uh, that he's such a down-to-earth human being and that uh, he is uh, connecting with, with reality in very much the same way that, that, that I do with food and with art and, and literature and so on. So it was, it, it's a very uh, important part of the memories that I have with Michael. It was all the, all the um, sharing of, of those non-mathematical, non-scientific experiences. So what else do, do I have here to mention? Um, so this is in the summer. Um, I think I have another picture which came later that year. So the next thing that, that we did together was um, the next thing that, that, we, that Michael wanted to do was to uh, attend one of, the, one of the conferences that he regularly attended, which is the Heidelberg Laureate Forum. So this is a meeting that um, gathers laureates in mathematics and computer science, so mostly field and Abel medalists and uh, Turing medalists, with young promising students. Um, and so we, we decided to go there. And we decided to not only go there, but actually organize a workshop. So as part of the, uh, if you were one of the, one of the laureates, you were uh, given the opportunity to give talks and to organize workshops and so on. 
And so Michael uh, very generously again offered me the opportunity to work on, on one of these workshops that, that could be organized for, for the conference. And so I, I, um, I um, started uh, com conversations with three other, uh, two other uh, organizers that he had in mind. And we started talking about what, what kind of contents will go into, into that course. So here you can see us, uh, the three organizers of the course and, and Michael at the meeting, right? So that's me in the middle with white hair at that time I dyed my hair and uh, the, the two collaborators and, and Michael himself. So you can see this was the, the, last, the, last, day, the, the last day of the conference. Uh, again, Michael surrounded by people constantly, um, um, not so much because of uh, his, his fame and status. There was a lot of young people there that just wanted to meet the legend. Uh, but but he would sit down and really have conversations with with, with everyone. I mean, he, he would be sitting at a table surrounded by maybe 20, 30 people and having conversations with all of them. Uh, where, where are you from? And then, well, you're working on this. Oh, your supervisor knew this other person. That I... So he was always finding all these connections. It was very, uh, very astonishing to, to behold, to be to be around Michael in, the, in these kind of environments. And, and so, yes, you can see it's uh, three young mathematicians uh, organizing the seminar and him which I think was the youngest of the four. And um, so, yes, it was, it was a wonderful, wonderful experience to, um, to go to, to uh, Heidelberg with, with Michael and to have the opportunity to work with, with um, the other collaborators and, and do the course and so on. So now, I should now mention that uh, the Heidelberg Lord Forum was when he announced that he had proven the Riemann hypothesis. And I think... I should take the time in this in this short memory to explain the the inside story of of his um, claim to the proof of the Riemann hypothesis. I think it's important that the world understands what this was coming from, and I think it's important that uh, there is some um, clarity on how Michael was experiencing his his own ideas, because for those for those who knew Michael at the time well. There was no news when when he, when this came out. They 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 knew that Michael was essentially working by analogy, was working from memory. He was not really doing mathematical research per se, and, and this is very true. I, I at the beginning of my of my of my uh, work with him, I couldn't see this, but over the course of years, I I really I really got to understand what Michael was doing, and Michael was really, in some sense, dreaming mathematics and, and so this is why i wanted to call uh this this video a mathematician's night dream not only because of michael's uh poem that he liked to to quote often but also because his mathematical life towards the end of his life was very much like a dream so in a dream you there are times where you can do things that they can feel uh perhaps quite um real and, and, and perhaps co cohesive and coherent and you can maybe even make some progress uh, when in solving a problem while dreaming but overall and often dreams are not that uh, well defined right they're very blurry and they are um, inconsistent and you know they don't have a full close narrative and so on so this is very much what uh, michael's uh, work was at the time uh, michael's mind was extremely active it was when it came to more human, um, so sort of more humanly uh, bound uh, topics, such as politics or, as I said, food or, or culture or, or, or history, these kind of things. His mind was very much working uh, perfectly, if not uh, better than than anyone would expect at that, at that age. I mean, it's pretty incredible. But when it comes to mathematical thinking and, and really developing mathematical theory and proving theorems and, and making precise statements and so on, his mind was not really uh, at that stage. I don't think he could hold the, 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 the line of the, the, the train of thought enough at that age. This is just, a, I think, a sign of old age. There, there was, for, for someone so special um, to, be, to be functioning at that level, at that age is already incredible. So it's perhaps not, not so surprising that the hard mathematical work um, that, that is um, normally attributed to, to, to you know, 
the brightest moments of someone's career was not going to happen in, in these years. And indeed, Michael was most of the time, as I say, working by analogy. He was reciting some uh, facts and, 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 and some um, uh, ideas and concepts that, that he very much understood uh, at a younger age. And he even discovered himself and developed himself. But at this point, it was more of a dream of, of ideas, right? So it was just a, a big um, cocktail of, 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 of blurry notions that <clears throat> here and there more, maybe coalesced into something a bit more concrete, but, but not, not to go over too much on, on, on how Michael's mind was, was deteriorating because it was very much deteriorating. This is, uh, I mean, we shouldn't, I don't think we, we should uh, uh, mask this. We should, we should not uh, pretend that this was not happening. I mean, he was a human being and his mind was very much deteriorating. He's, he's, he was at the very end of his life when I met him and, and his mind was very much not at his prime. And, and this was just the sign of it, right? So, so Michael uh, sadly had a very conscious experience of all of this. He knew that most of his papers uh, were not accepted uh, or had not been accepted for a long time already when I met him. He had worked on the complex structures on, on, on the sixth sphere. Uh, he had worked on, um, well, with already with me on uh, the structure constant. So the structure constant is a, is a, is a physical constant that is dimensionless from um, quantum electrodynamics. And Michael had the idea that he could prove that this, this dimensionless constant, which is carries no units, so it can be deduced in some numerical way, he could deduce it from some geometric theory that involved division algebras in some, in some essential, essential, essential way. And the way this goes is the structure constants happens to have a numerical value that is very, very close to 1 over 147. And it so happens that if you add all the, all the squares of the, of the dimensions of the division algebras, the reals, the complex, the, quater the quaternions and the octonions, so 1 plus 1 squared plus 2 squared plus 4 squared plus 8 squared, it happens to precisely give 147. So he was fascinated by, by this fact. And, um, and he was convinced that that numerological coincidence um, meant that the structure constant had to be described in a, in, in a, in a transcendental way, as a transcendental number in, in, in mathematics. So he worked on this idea for quite a while, and I, I helped um, writing the paper and writing the notes on, on, this, on this theory of the structure constant, and I even um, so I, I, I managed to put him in contact with Adolfo Azcárraga, who is the president of the Royal Physical Society in Spain. And he even published a note on, on the bulletin saying uh, or explaining this, these ideas of Michael and, and having the... And he, he was invited to Madrid again to give a talk at, at, the, at the Faculty of, of, of Sciences in the in Complutense University in Madrid, in the physics department. So, so he was very much um, working on this. He, he, to, to Michael's mind, the Phytonsum theorem had, been a, had, had just finished and had been a success at that point, and he wanted to move on to a, a more um, ambitious goal. And that more ambitious goal was showing that the, the fine structure constant was deduced from some geometric arguments that really had nothing to do directly with physics. Um, so this was very controversial and, and, and he was aware of this. So I'm, 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 I'm recalling this because he was very aware that, that this was um, that this was controversial, that, uh, for example, the archive was not, that was not accepting his papers. So, so somehow the archive was um, trying to prevent Michael from, from submitting more more papers because the, the several papers that he did submit at the time had been um, had been shown to, to to really hold no no mathematical ground right so so it is in this context that one day I, I as I normally did I went down 
um, the, the Pleasance Road into what is called here May Road um, and Mayfield Road, sorry, and and then going to his into his apartment. Um, he had a very beautiful flat uh, at the top of a, of a short building with with lots of um, um, windows and open spaces and a little piano that I'd sometimes played for him. And um, and sometimes if the weather was nice, we'd go outside to a balcony. It'll be it'll be very very nice. Was, there's always refreshment. This was a, a feature of of our meetings. He would always. Uh, call for refreshments at some point. If we were in the university, you would talk to, to the secretary and, and ask for some refreshments. Would usually be some orange juice. If we were at home, there would always be some tea or some, some biscuits or something. It was very important to him that there would be refreshments at some point in the meeting. Um, so it was one of these days when I would go down, uh, 10 in the morning was always the time. Um, by this time, Michael would have been working for at least three hours prior to my visit. So I would find him sort of all curled up around his desk and, and writing and, and, and trying to type some emails. And he would say, oh, come in, come in, good morning. And then always so welcoming, always so, so nice. And this particular day, we would move to the sofas, we would sit down and look to the ceiling and start talking and start explaining all the marvelous ideas that he had been thinking about, um, explaining to me at times, asking, oh, are you familiar with? And then insert some mathematical theory. And if I say yes, then he'd say, so in that case, you should know that. Blah, blah, blah. And then you go into quite a technical uh, conversation. Or if I say, no, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't really study that. Then he would give me a very quick summary of, of that theory and then proceed to give me the exact same technical description. So, so it was a very much uh, a, a day like that. But at the, towards the end of the meeting, I could see that there was a there was a book um, on on the life of of Riemann, uh, the biography of Riemann, uh, sitting at the table, and I think Michael caught my eye uh, looking at the, at the book or or just noticed, and he he said, oh yes, I'm reading this book, um, I, I'm I'm rereading the the classics uh, and the biographies because I think that it's always very important to go back and to understand where where the ideas come from and so on. And so he, he told me that he had been thinking about Riemann and his life and so on because he had been reading uh, Riemann's biography. And then next day, so day after, same thing, 10 in the morning, go down Mayfield Road and, uh, and bus in the, in the responder and, and, and I go up three floors uh, to, to, his, to his apartment. And then he greets me and he says, Carlos, I've been... I've been dreaming tonight and I woke up and I, I woke up at three in the morning and I couldn't I couldn't fall asleep again because I I know I have the proof for the Riemann hypothesis. So when I heard this, it was very much in character. So it didn't surprise me. I didn't I didn't react with any particular surprise of oh, there might be a proof for the Riemann hypothesis here, because I had seen him just under 24 hours uh, before, he had not mentioned the Riemann hypothesis any time. In all the years that I had collaborated with him, that I had worked with him, the few years that I was in Edinburgh, I had, I had produced a, something like four or five slides for talks where he would cover massive amount of ground of things he was thinking about and the theories in his program that, that we will go and the should be proved and how the geometry is, go is gonna lead the way and how physics is gonna become this mathematical theory, everything is gonna be so perfect and so on. Very much in the vein of Einstein and he was always mentioning his heroes being Einstein and Maxwell and, and all these things. So, so that's very much, that was his main endeavor towards the end of his life. The fine structure constant was the first real test to his theory and he was, uh, very insisting that we should get it to work. And he was convinced it was working. It was, it was not really working, but he was convinced it was. I was writing more notes and, and giving more arguments. And, you know, he was very much in, in, in that project. Um, and, and he really ramped up speed. Something that, that is important to understand, as I, as I mentioned, is that when I met him, he was in this, uh, in this state of mind of, I need to get people, I need to get collaborators so that we can launch this project. And then this, he got this Lever Hulma grant and uh, that was the project, the, the project began. Um, so, 
so it's it's important to understand that Riemann hypothesis had never been part of the part of the project. It was never it was not even close to to many of the formulations, many of the sort of streams of ideas that that people were people were uh, working on in in the in the collaboration. And then one day, I would argue because he was reading about Riemann, he told me the day before I've been reading about Riemann and, and, and his life and you know the hypothesis and so on. He mentioned it, and just one day later, he tells me that he wakes up and that he knows the proof for the Riemann hypothesis. So, as I say, I don't take this to be that different from many other things that he's saying because he was extremely convinced that the fine structure constant was deducible directly from the division algebras and some geometric theory that, that he was convinced could be put down in a few sentences, but he just didn't have the time to, to flesh out the details. So every time that someone would uh, ask him to, to provide more details, he would give more explanations and more sort of hand waving and say, but really it's just a matter of sitting down and, and doing it. Um, personally, I think that was not really the case. As I said, he was more like dreaming the, the arguments and, and dreaming the mathematics. And perhaps there were very good ideas there. I think that's why I want to, I think it's important to communicate them. I think that Michael always had very good ideas, even late in his life, but he was not really thinking strictly mathematically in, in a sense that is, that is perhaps useful to, to working mathematicians uh, that are interested in the actual theory proving and all these kind of things. So his claim to, to the proof of the Riemann hypothesis is very much uh, in this vein, right? So he's very much in this context where he dreams about doing mathematics and, and then he sees the mathematics and, and he remembers, I guess, uh, a, life, a lifetime of doing mathematics and has the, almost the you know, the cognitive repetition, right? The, 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 the muscle memory in some sense, the mathematical muscle memory to, to go over this sort of lines of thought. But the work is not really being done. And, and this was the most apparent with the Riemann hypothesis. Unfortunately, as now is public and everyone, everyone knows, uh, it, it, was, it was turned into a media storm. So because and uh, I, can, I can record this anecdote, he, anecdote here for anyone who's interested. Um, that day when I, when I went to, to Michael's and he says, I have the proof of the Riemann hypothesis, we were writing an email to the Heidelberg, Heidelberg Lorette um, Forum organizers about the, about the meeting that we were doing, about the seminar that we were doing. So um, this picture here on the screen is showing the, the organizers for this for this seminar. So Michael was giving a keynote talk and we were organizing this, this seminar with him. So we thought, let's let's uh, finish up the, the plan for the seminar and let's send the organizers our, um, our final notes and all, all the materials that they need. So that was what the meeting was about. That's the reason why I was at Michael's flat. And what happened was that when... when, when Michael could write emails, and he, he did write emails, but if I was around, I would type much faster, and I would find files much faster, and I could do the attachments and everything much faster. So if I, if I was around in his flat, I would type the emails for him. So I would sit down on the computer, and he said, okay, let's send uh, uh, the, the Heidelberg people uh, our, our plan and our materials. So, you know, get the files, attach them to the, to the email, very routine stuff. And then the, when we were about to send the email, he said, oh, wait a minute, why don't we check the timetable to, to make sure that everything is, is working fine? So I would go to the HLF, the Heidelberg Lorette Forum website, check on the timetable. He's just looking at the times, and then he spots that one of the, for one of the seminars uh, on the first day is on some numerical, um, some numerical, uh, numerical number theory or computational number theory that uh, perhaps can shed some light on the Riemann hypothesis. So the Riemann hypothesis is mentioned, not as the, as the main topic in any of the talks or seminars, but as part of the possible interest in, 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 some, of the, in some of the seminars. And he says, oh, we need to, uh, we need to inform the organizers that, uh, that I have a proof. So perhaps I have something related to say to this seminar or I wanted to... So, so he, 
he saw that someone was talking about the Riemann hypothesis or the Riemann hypothesis was going to be mentioned. So he really wanted to, to tell the organizers then that he had a proof. So he said, please add a, a pod script with what I say. And he started saying, I think I have a proof of the Riemann hypothesis, blah, 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 blah. I was like, okay, Michael, so why don't you, why don't you um, first consult with your with your uh, council. So we used to say that Michael had a council because he had a mailing list of several Nobel Prizes and field medalists and, and, and important scientists and, and mathematicians. And he would send things around and he would contra contrast ideas around. He had conversations with Ed Witten and, and uh, Alain Kahn and, you know, very important mathematicians over, over email. And so I just suggested and, and he would normally include me because I had the files and I had to forward them the, the, the files to, to these other people. So so I, I, I suggested, Michael, why don't you first discuss it with, with the council, right? With your with your friends, with your with your, your peers. And and he said, No, no, no. I'll do that later as well. But but now we we need to tell them because the, they are they're organizing this and he was, as you can imagine, uh, very energetic and very uh, passionate about this. So he was, he actually got angry at me that I was just not typing what he was saying and just sending the email. So he was getting very frustrated that I was trying to, to push back a little and say, Michael, you, I, I was not saying, Michael, you don't have a proof, you can't say it because it's important to know, I should mention it here that um, even though the people who, who were close to him at, at the end of his life, we knew that what he was doing was mostly dreaming mathematics and not so much doing mathematics, we we saw that this was his lifeblood. He was he was so passionate about it. He was so happy. He was every day he woke up super motivated and, and extremely energetic. And um, even despite the situation, um, his wife had died recently. Um, you know, some family issues. His health was deteriorating. It was really quite astonishing to see all that energy in that in that situation. So we felt that it was it would be such a tragedy to to really convince him that what he was doing was was wrong and we couldn't convince him i mean that's that's the part, another part of the story that even if we tried it would be impossible to convince him that what he was doing was was perhaps wrong or that he he was too old to do this i mean so it was it was absolutely out of out of the question that we would argue in that direction uh, for for many reasons but in any case he got angry at me because i was i was just not following his orders to just type in and send um, because i know I knew what would happen if I did that because I knew that those were the organizers. They were not. They weren't the scientific committee. It was just the organizers. So, if Michael Atiyah, Sir Michael Atiyah, the great mathematician, claims that he has a proof for the Riemann hypothesis, they would probably go into a media storm around about it because the the the, the, the Heidelberg Laureate Forum is quite a high profile event and they are trying to you know advertise it and have a lot of press and a lot of people from all kind of all kinds of uh, institutions go to the to the conference so i knew that that would be a very a very high risk um and so i, I tried to stop uh, michael from from mentioning it mentioning it to the organizers a lot but i realized at the end of uh, of the day that if he really wanted to mention it obviously I, I had there was nothing i could do because he can write emails himself so um so i had to type it so i remember typing um ps um I see you have a seminar on the Riemann hypothesis, but this might not be necessary because I have a proof for Riemann hypothesis. And I mean, obviously the email was being uh, written by him. It's just, I was typing it. So it's signed by, by Michael. Um, and so what, what, after, what happened afterwards uh, is, as they say, history, because um, this was the media storm that then followed with um, the organizers, the HLF organizers tweeting out uh, the, the fact that um, Michael might have, they did say they, that he did have, but might have a proof for the Riemann hypothesis. And then uh, they decided to re reshuffle the schedule to put him in a different uh, slot to talk about the proof for the Riemann hypothesis instead of his, his, uh, his main topic, which was the fine structure constant. He still talked about it because, of course, his, 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 uh, his talk was going to be about everything. Uh, but but they, they changed the title to, to, to include the proof um, for the Riemann hypothesis and they, they advertised it. And there was a media storm about it. I'm sure that everyone watching uh, who, or anyone who is slightly interested on, on that part of the history of mathematics remembers that all the media 
echoed about this. Uh, Sir Michael Atiyah claims to have solved the Riemann hypothesis. And of course, if true, it would be absolutely incredible. Um, but there is a tendency for all mathematicians to do this. So I was very, uh, I was very uh, conflicted uh, that, that I was the person clicking, clicking send to this email that created this meteor storm. And I have to say, at a personal level, I think Michael was aware of it. I didn't really worry, I didn't really worry too much about Michael. I knew that this would be similar to the to what um, the fine structure constant had been, or to what the the complex structure in a six sphere had been. I knew that he would argue about it. I knew he, that he would have many ideas, probably useful and, and good ideas for other people to to develop. Um, but but he would not actually have the final answer to to the to the problem and, and definitely not a complete proof that you can present in a mathematical conference um, so the so the rest is is uh, as everyone know uh, everyone knows uh, the bit of a tragedy of marketing stunt on the side of HLF I think they they really try to seize the opportunity to create a lot of media interest in the meeting and at the cost of uh, Michael's reputation because of course if you get that email and you're an organizer you run it with the scientific committee directly and the scientific committee would say well that's highly unlikely given uh, Michael's recent work and it, if anything if we should we should uh, get some evidence that there is a proof before announcing that there is that there might be a proof um, so what they announced was Michael's claim uh, to have a proof and I think that's the mistake they should have they should have kept to to the plan give give Michael a, a, a talk and keep the title as it is and uh, and and if Michael wants to uh, change the title to to have a, a mention to the Riemann hypothesis then the scientific committee should to, to, should have a conversation but none of that happened it was just directly uh, tweeted out in fact the, the email that I wrote was tweeted out. It was quoted. Uh, the line, the PS line, uh, was quoted and, and and tweeted, and that's what happened. So I think it was a bit sad, but nonetheless, uh, HLF, uh, where where that picture was taken, was a wonderful, wonderful experience. I personally enjoyed it very, very much. Um, just meeting the people, uh, I met a dear friend now, um, Sylvia Buti there as, as well. Um, Absolutely, absolutely wonderful event, and seeing Michael at his best, and I think that was probably one of the one of the best conferences that uh, Michael attended in terms of his participation and his enjoyment. Uh, I mean, as as he told me, he, he said that it was one of the most interesting events that he had attended in in, in recent in recent years. So I was very happy to be there. So I thought that that was something that needed uh, clarifying, and that I should. Um, should have um, clarified here for the record that that's how the Riemann hypothesis uh, came to be. And that was uh, how Michael uh, experienced it. He was very aware that people didn't take him seriously. He was very aware that um, people were very skeptical about his work. And he just thought that, you know, people didn't see what he saw. He, he was not he was not uh, conceding that he was not uh, he was done as a mathematician. He he just trusted his instinct so much. Uh, and can you really blame him to trust his instinct so much? Because he had been right for so many decades, not just years, but decades in the past, had been so right about so many things where he had an intuition or he had a vision, and and it was fully fleshed out and realized in 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 the future, right, at a later time. And um, can you really blame him? that he wakes up from a dream and he has a gut feeling that he's proven the Riemann hypothesis. I don't think you, you can really blame him. And, um, but it was, it was a bit, a bit um, yeah, conflicting to, to be around that, that media storm and all the interest that was generated. Of course, there were some funny moments where, where people would come to me saying, oh, have you heard Michael Atiyah has a proof of the Riemann hypothesis? And, and uh, I found this this document online, and they would show me some PDF, and I was like, I wrote that PDF because I am I am Michael's assistant. So it was it was it was interesting on my side to be so close to the to the eye of the storm in in, in that sense, and in, in the wider mathematical community. 
But at the end of the day, I think that it really, it was a bit sad that Michael decided to really push hard for, for these very ambitious ideas at the end of his life. Um, and I think kind of more and more um, retract from, from the feedback. He, he, he really stopped listening to feedback uh, entirely at some point. And he would sit down to, to talk. And as long as you're talking, you're having an exchange, he'll be very happy. But, but if, if someone just uh, really contested his, his claims, he would disengage. And, and I, think it, it's, I, th I think that's another side of what he was doing. He was um, very much playing to be a mathematician in some sense. It's, it was a sort of an old age hobby going back to his, to his uh, glory days of, of, of doing mathematics. And I think he was doing that. And as I said before, it's such a beautiful thing to have to, to wake up early in the morning, every day, full of energy with, with ideas on how to do and to give ideas to, to visitors coming from Norway, from uh, Poland, from, uh, from Cambridge, from always uh, uh, all different places in the world, being invited. He, he went to Rio de Janeiro to the International Mathematical Conference. He went to China several times, you know, this time. He went to Oxford. We were invited uh, again by my friend Carlos Blanco to, to an Altius conference in, in Oxford where he again talked about the beauty in mathematics and so on. He, it, was, it was incredible, um, knowing Michael. He was a force of nature. I think this is an expression that a lot of people use who, who um, talk to Michael and to, who knew Michael. He was a force of nature. Um, he, he's, he was a very special human being. Uh, I, I am, of course, not the right person to, to give you uh, any historical review. This is everywhere else. Um, uh, by, by anyone else who's, who's had a much longer contact with him. But I just got to see the final, the final uh, burst of energy, the final flashes of this uh, very bright star in the, in the scientific and mathematical and intellectual night sky. Right? It, was, it was quite a, quite a, quite a time. And uh, I, I feel very personally attached to him because um, towards the end, perhaps I should move to just talking about the end of his life. Um, we just continued after, after this conference for some months. Um, and um, into 2018, which is, was going to be the year where I finished my PhD, and uh, we went home for Christmas and I came back. And when I came back, a few days uh, when I was in my office, my supervisor wa walked in. I said, Carlos Michael passed away this morning. Um, and so it was a very, it was a very disconcerting time. Um, I didn't, I didn't expect that at all. Nobody expected that. Uh, he had, he had gone to the hospital a couple, a couple of days before, had some heart complications. Um, but he was organizing a seminar. I mean, I guess that's, that, that, that tells you everything. He was organizing uh, a seminar at the university and he was going to give a talk in a week's time, um, right before he died. So, so that tells you um, how Michael died doing what he did all his life. Um, so I think that that can be the, probably the best end to anyone, to, to die in, in, in the middle of, of what you really want to do. And he had so much hope for these for this visions and ideas. And I think that that's something that, that really, that really uh, I don't know, inspired me to, to, to also really go for the vision and my own personal projects. And now with creating SEMF and, and really thinking of the science of the 21st century, Michael Atiyah was very much a scientist of the, of the 20th century. And now thinking about the science of the, of the 20th century um, it was very inspiring to have this, to witness this final burst of, of energy uh, from this, as I say, this uh, bright star of the, of the intellectual night sky. But yes, I think that's uh, going to be my, my conclusion to my thoughts about Michael and my experience with Michael. I don't know if anyone's listening right now and they have some comments or some questions here in the chat. Uh, I'll be very happy to, to answer any curiosities or any questions, uh, of course. But yes, I think that's my, my conclusion about Michael.
there are many anecdotes that could be told, um, but I think I would leave it at that at, um, reflection on, on the last few the last few br bursts of energy from a bright star. And I, I like that the metaphor it was very special mathematician, very special human being. And Very special. So unless um, someone wants to know something in particular about Michael, I think I'm gonna close the stream and um, I'll leave it at that um, I think this uh, picture of Michael is really nice in front of his Gracias a ti for escuchar that was um, my memories with Michael Atilla thank you Federica no problem yeah, I got a bit emotional at the end. It's, it was, it was. I really wanted to do this because since he died, it was so sudden. It's been uh, sort of a, you know, life kept pushing, and and, and I really wanted to find the time to to condense my my thoughts about it. So it was my pleasure. Thank you, everyone. Yes, uh, thank you, Michael. Um, you're down there. It's in your Majesty. So it was, it was an honor to work with you and um, yeah you really helped me in, in my career and if I ever accomplish anything of note in science or mathematics I think you you played a big role in that as I'm sure hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people can say in in many other and more um, important ways so yeah thank you Michael <laughs>